the book, I, I read it, I enjoyed it, I enjoy all your books. This one, even more sort of up my alley because I won't say it crosses into politics because it really doesn't, but it gives you perspective on politics, namely in that a lot of what we consider important is not actually important at all in the scheme of things. Well, thanks for noticing that about the book. The book will feel like it's just this rant of opinions, but in fact, it's what the world looks like if you're scientifically literate. And there's so many people who dig their heels in and are sure that their point of view is correct and unassailable, and they should win at all costs against somebody else's point of view. And I just say, pause. All right. This, in fact, so many of these arguments are not even about, well, let's agree to disagree or let's compromise, is that there's another place neither of you are standing, a vista looking onto both of your arguments, which if you ascended to it, you'd realize you had no argument at all. I, I, give, I give a quick example. The, yeah. the, let's say you are a vegetarian. Uh, so there's a, there's a chapter, Meatarians and Vegetarians. So, <laughs> yeah. so let's say you're a vegetarian and you're a vegetarian because you don't want to kill animals. Okay, mm -hmm. you, you, wanna, you like animals. So you might have a humane mousetrap in your basement because you don't want to snap the neck of any wandering mice that's right. cruel and, and and all right so by the way you have to check those every couple of days because mice right will, or you starve it yeah yeah they'll, they'll dry out real fast so you got to check it every you can't go away on vacation with a humane mousetrap so you capture one and then you take it and what do they do with it they return it to the wild all right i don't know if they know that the life expectancy of a mouse in the wild is anywhere between nine and 18 months because they make tasty snacks for all manner of woodland predators. You know, the owls and the, and the you know, the crows and the, and the, 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 the foxes and all, if, if, if you live anywhere near any woods, all of those are in the woods and the mice are tasty. Whereas, in the comfort and safety of your basement, they can live up to six years. So if you really cared about the fate of the mouse, <laughs> you would just welcome it into your house and all its mice friends. But you yeah. don't because you believe you have, you have a sort of a moral high ground by protecting the life of the mouse by not killing it upon entering your residence. It's, it's points like that. And by the way, one doesn't need a PhD in astrophysics to realize this, but it does help to have some of the wiring you get for free, if you will, by being scientifically trained. Because you look at a question, you look at a problem, you look at solutions people have proposed and ask, is this the best? Is it the most efficient? Are they missing a point of view? Is there bias in that point of view? All of this matters. And you'd be surprised how many opinions we hold dearly that would just simply evaporate under that kind of scrutiny. It's a little scary because what it means is, or actually it shouldn't be scary. It should be a relief that we're always gonna be wrong about a lot of things. Yeah, not only that, that, that okay. yeah, the relief is not only that you might be wrong, which you have to be prepared to accept, but mm -hmm. that you might have more in agreement with the person you're arguing with than you ever imagined. Yes, that's, if that, it serves us well today. Uh, you wrote something along the lines, of, I'm paraphrasing here, truth and scientific conclusions exist whether you believe in it or not. Actually, you may have told me that in person a long time okay. ago. Yes, yeah, so, um, so, so the bumper sticker version of that is, mm -hmm. science is true whether or not you believe in it, all mm -hmm. right? But the, but the frontier of science is a contested uh, place. So, so, I, so the non-bumper sticker version of it is, objective truths established by repeated scientific experiments are not later shown to be false and they are true regardless of whether you believe them you could fit that on a bumper sticker no, you just no read it. that's too much too much <laughs> yeah too much depends on your bumper mm -hmm. uh would you agree that we have as a society well it seems like we've lost our ability to distinguish between facts and opinions i don't know if that's it's of, of course it's not everyone but it seems like society at large sort of got, we shook up the container a little bit too much with facts and opinions. Yeah, let basically. me give you a slightly different view of that same correct fact, that I think we never really had the ability to distinguish the, the, the full capacity, uh, 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 methods and tools to distinguish, distinguish truth from, from falsehoods. But today, 
you people have platforms to express their views that where their views can be louder than ever before. So it creates quite the cacophony in the space of, of public discourse. So I would say, and this is almost a cop out to give this as an excuse, that what we're missing is certain training in elementary school in K through 12, more yeah. broadly, where sure. you learn that science is not some satchel of facts. Science is a way of querying nature. Science is a way of thinking about what is and is not true. The scientific method, which gets eviscerated of its, of its um, joy when it said, well, it's a, a induction, deduction, experiment, conclusion. No, no, just, I'll tell you what the scientific method is. It's do whatever it takes to not fool yourself into thinking something is true that is not. And do whatever it takes to not fool yourself to thinking something is not true that is. That's the scientific method. We do not have those abilities. They're not, we're not trained to do that. So when, when I see people saying things that would be patently false to anyone with scientific um, awareness, I don't, my urge, especially as an educator, is not to bop them on the head. That's, that's not my urge. My urge is, okay, how can we prevent this in the future? Why is it that photos from space of a rotating earth are not convincing to people who think earth is flat? What's missing in their training? Uh, and, and, and there are people who don't know what the word skepticism means. If you're a skeptic, it doesn't mean you doubt everything. It means you understand the role that evidence plays in apportioning your confidence in whether something is true. That's important because I, I do, I consider myself a skeptic. We have Skeptical Sunday episodes where we debunk things like GMOs or the lottery, for example. And people say, I'm a skeptic too. Did you know, yeah, the earth is flat or the moon landing was fake? And it's like, well, that's what Carl Sagan was talking about when he said, be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brain falls out. Plus, I'd also say debunk is a very harsh word. Yeah. Um, and consider the following. Uh, it's just as intellectually lazy to deny that something is tr true as it is to completely accept it as truth without investigation. So if I say, oh, here's some crystals, I'll sell them to you and they'll heal your ailments. You say, oh, great, great, here's the money. And that's, okay, that's lazy. That's, if I say, here's some crystals, uh, it'll heal your ailments. You say, oh, that's impossible. That'll never, can never be true. That's also lazy. What takes effort and energy and a little bit of training is how to ask questions. Where are these crystals from? What is it about the crystals that gives them these powers? What is the evidence to support it? Has that evidence been, evidence been duplicated? What, uh, can you show me where that was? And, and but halfway through, the person is in tears <laughs> walking away. Typically, if they're otherwise charlatans in this exercise. So I, I say this because I will stand here flat footed and tell you the entire universe was once the size of a marble. And you can believe me because I'm an astrophysicist and I carry that quote authority, but I would be joyed, overjoyed if you asked questions about that. And it would be my task as an educator to see, do I have enough information to convince you as you uh, proceed along your skeptical path? And, and so, yeah, so yeah. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want to say debunking. There's a lot of really weird things that are true today mm -hmm. discovered by science. So I just want to say it's discussing ideas that people who are absent some level of scientific literacy could benefit from learning what the truth is. I think when I when I use the word debunk, and I appreciate the nuance here, the lottery is sort of not good for you. And I think we can say people who say, like people who advertise for the lottery, don't necessarily have your best interest in mind. Uh, debunk, is that still a strong and, 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 word at that point? <laughs> so, uh, so there's a whole chapter in the book on, on, called Risk and Reward. Mm -hmm. And there's a point I make that I've never seen people make before, but I, it's, very, it's very real, all right? 
Do you know all these branches of math that you learned in school? Oh, They're God. sort of arithmetic and algebra and trigonometry and algebra two and then calculus. All of this. I was there. That's all I oh, uh, geometry. I yeah. looked up geometry. All of those branches of math predate probability and statistics. Do you realize all of those branches I of math were established right. before yeah. anyone even thought that it would be a good idea <laughs> to take an average of numbers? What that tells me is thinking statistically and probabilistically has to be one of the most anathematic, is there even such a word? So uh, it has to be, uh, anath it has to be anathema to the the native wiring of our brain. Otherwise, yeah. it would be otherwise it would be easy. We would we would take to it yeah. like that. We would intuit it, and it would be really really old. It would be like remember when we invented it? It was on the stone tablet. Them telling us <laughs> oh, how to do that. that. <laughs> You're taking averages. You know, Thag took an average of how big the bison were. Right. That they, well, whatever. Okay. So so, but let's let's keep following this. So it must not be natural to think that way. Here's evidence of that. An advertiser could show you data that was the, statistic, the statistics of a thousand people and their comments on a product, okay? And they had very good comments on the product. You say, hey, I'm gonna buy that product, but that's not what they do. They show one person testifying with great emotion. Oh, I was lost and I didn't know what I was doing. And then I found this product and it was amazing. You're going to buy the product because you heard one person say that the product changed their life, not because you saw data of thousands of people for whom that very same result would have been true. Advertisers know this. They know to not show you bar charts, statistics, averages. They know this. And so not only that, we have people in society who exploit this very weakness of the human mental capacity. And these are casino owners. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they know there are people in there saying in the roulette wheel, a seven is due. We haven't had a seven in a while. Mm -hmm. A seven is due. No, a seven is not due. You don't understand probability and statistics. Step away from the roulette wheel. <laughs> okay. Take some courses in this so that you can learn. Uh, I, I retell a story. Was it 1987? The American Physical Society, professional organization of the nation's physicists, because of a snafu of hotel reservations in one city versus another, they had to move. They, they couldn't hold their conference. I think it was in New Orleans. Something happened with the hotel. So Vegas said, come to us. We got the, the MGM Grand or, you know, we got one of the biggest hotels in the world. We can accommodate all of you. So on short notice, thousands of physicists descended on Las Vegas in the MGM Hotel. MJ Marina Hotel it was at the time. At the end of the week, there's a headline. Physicists in town, lowest casino take ever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was rumored that the physicists were told to never return <laughs> to the city. Okay, so you can think, well, maybe the physicists broke the code yeah, for how they, they could figured win. it no. out. Yeah. No, no, they just simply didn't play. And by the way, is probability and statistics given in elementary school or middle school or high school? No, not really. You can take it as an elective or as an AP class, but it's not in there with the with the um, algebra and the tr trigonometry. While you're learning trig identities, maybe you should also be learning some basic statistics. So getting back to, uh, that's my long response yeah, to your comment it. about the lottery. I've only heard one what I would call legitimate reason for playing the lottery. Did I tell you what that was? Okay. I, you know, you can tell us. I, I think I know where you're going, but I'm going to let you do it. You're making my job really How easy. do you know where I'm going? You, no, you, know, well, you don't know where I'm going. Why do you think you know where I'm going? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you the Psychic reason. powers, man. My... Th this is the mother of a fellow astrophysicist told me this. She said, Shh, you know those brochures? I don't know if they still print them, but certainly online. We see all these really fancy homes that you can't afford. Yeah, okay. of course. I love looking at those. Yeah, and you just, yeah, of course. We all love looking at those homes. This is America. 
there's a chance one day you'll be rich and maybe live in one of those or have more money than you do, whatever. So there's a joy to just, she buys one lottery ticket a week and thinks to herself, if I won the lottery this week, this is the home I would buy. And that brings her a certain psychological joy to even have those thoughts. No, she's not buying a thousand tickets and, you know, right, scratching out the thing. It's, it's just one ticket. So that while she's reading it, there's a chance she can move into one of those homes. And I said, I am not going to take that away from you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I didn't know where you were going because it's in the book. That, that's the real answer the to your okay. question. Okay. Um, <laughs> did that mean you actually read the yeah, book? Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah. No, I wasn't lying. I don't just lie about that. Uh, I, okay. I just do the work. Um, it's actually harder to do an interview if you haven't read the book, unless you, for some reason, know that person really well already, or you just are no. really good bullshitter. But no, I they'll, they'll pay, yeah, they pay, they can fake it and say, what do you want people to know about your book? Right. right? And that way they're not really asking. Yeah. But then you get uh, the same interview as everybody else, which you, if you're right. doing a tour like this, I'm betting statistics, I, I would say, are probably oh. on my side that many people ask the exact same questions because they no, get except them. Except the book, the book is so culturally, so sociologically diverse mm -hmm. that I think each platform is going to pick what matters to them and their audiences more than what would be for someone else, I, I would guess. So... Uh, there's a whole chapter on gender and identity and on, you know, vegetarians and meat eaters. And, you know, that's if they read the chapter. book, though. If they did. Uh, yeah, yeah. If, if they read the book. Yeah. There's a chapter on truth and beauty, a chapter on life and death. So there are a lot of places you can go depending on your ph ph philosophical leanings. Well, I'm going to I'm going to make a hard left here because I save up science and space related questions for you in a notes file on my phone because we talk like once every year or two. And then I pick the why ones. Is that a left, why is that a left turn instead of a right turn? It, you know, because a right turn seems more predictable, whereas this one, it's like, ah, this isn't even in your book. It's just random. OK, stuff. But, but 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 three rights make a left. I'm going to make three right turns in that case. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I pick the ones that I think are the most okay. interesting whenever you're coming on. And I'm like, oh, there's half my prep is done, but then I still read the book because I'm OCD about reading the books about Good. the guests. Uh, it's about that time. So this is, this is probably like the space equivalent of when you're a doctor and someone pulls up their shirt at the dinner table and says, does this look infected to you? Okay. Um, okay. Why, when scientists are naming nebulas, for example, do they name it both the Hand of God Nebula, the Cat's Eye Nebula, the Pac-Man Nebula, but then it's also called NGC 618? Why not just stick with the name? Oh, because those, ne <laughs> that's a great question. Um, certain categories of objects in the sky were cataloged for being the same kind of object. And so they have a catalog number, sometimes in the sequence they were discovered, other times in, in their sequence from sort of east to west across the sky, so that it sort of matches their sky lo longitude, if you will. So that's why you have, you have certain phone numbers for each of these objects that have pluses and minus signs in them. Those relate to whether it's above the equator or below the equator, so that their coordinate becomes part of their catalog number. So they all have catalog numbers, galaxies, stars, and but then if it looks like something we're going to call it that <laughs> and in my field we call them as we see them so every everything you just listed there is an actual nebula in the sky we have a tarantula nebula a lagoon nebula a north american nebula a a pac-man nebula a like as you had duly mentioned these go on and on and on and those are the colloquial reference to what they are i i, I think botany has something similar we have we have colloquial names for certain plants or, like a or Venus flytrap, and then it's got a Latin name that I, no no, one it's knows. might have some Latin yeah. thing, which is a more precise. And when you're communicating across languages, that's where you, or where culture does not is not should not influence the science. That's when they do it. But in in my field, our culture is all over the science, so we just kind of accept it. That that makes sense. My my guess was. Well, if you're talking with your colleagues in Beijing, they don't they're not going to remember the hand of God or the or maybe that's offensive to your colleagues in Dubai. They don't want to use that term. So it's like, let's just stick with NGC 688. Everybody's cool with that. In Dubai, they have a God. We didn't say the hand of Jesus. We said the yeah, hand yeah. of God. But maybe they don't want to okay. they don't want to use that for anything. But, you know, I don't know. But God, maybe they're like, hey, we don't name things out in space. 
Oh, got you, got you. Right, right. You don't after, want to represent yeah. deity. Right, right. That's very Islamic and Jewish, yeah. actually, to, to not... So if you look at Jewish temples and Islamic uh, in, in mosques, there's no representation of any biblical characters anywhere, which is which which is the interpretation of the was it the first I would say first amendment <laughs> the first commandment uh, which was thou shalt not have graven images uh, before you so that has been interpreted by all Jews all devout Jews and all devout Muslims to not portray any deity and beyond that just any biblical character by illustrating what you think they look like so whereas Christianity said we're doing it yep. <laughs> okay, so, here's a huge yeah, yeah. genre of art all the faces yeah <laughs> it's an entire genre of art. we got Jesus we got Mary we got Joseph we got the Apostles you got everybody coming and going in the Bible uh, right there so about what, what was the point I was oh so so if you discover something you get to name it so that, that's all it's cool yeah that's a cool two-thirds of the sentence. stars in the night sky that have names have Arabic names because they weren't necessarily discovered in the Middle East um, or in the Gulf states, but they were they were identified and cataloged, and we respect that. During the Golden uh, Age of Islam, or what was that like thirteen yes, or something? Yeah, the golden age. Yeah, a thousand years ago. Okay. So the Golden Age of Is of Islam, where tremendous advances in in math and engineering and uh, navigation and astronomy, medicine, all of this. That's where people figured out that the eye doesn't send a beam of light outward, and that's why you see things. But think about well, it. I'd see in right? the dark if that were the case. Right, exactly. And that's how you get the legend of Medusa. All right. If Medusa looks at you, you turn to stone. Hmm. That implies something came out of her eyeballs and it went into your molecular chemistry and turned you into stone. To realize that sight is a 100% passive phenomenon took some deep thought, some curiosity, and cutting open the occasional cow eyeball. <laughs> to yeah. figure it out. <laughs> Hopefully only that. Yeah, exactly. It's, right, right. It's fun. Now that you mentioned the, the faces thing, when I was in Egypt like 20 years ago, we were in the middle of nowhere because we took a boat up the Nile. And when we had to go to the bathroom, they would just pull over and they'd say like, be quiet. There's roving bandits here and stuff and boars that will attack you. But we found some old tombs, I guess you would say, or staircases and things like that. And and we would go in there, and the the guys were. Wait, wait you you pooped on the tomb? No, no, that's a little that's a little much. Nearby, however, well, you started the story by saying I got to go to the bathroom. Yeah, but then you see, and we stop off at a tomb. You see a staircase okay. going down in the middle of nowhere. You're like, well, this is pretty interesting. I kind of want to check it out. And we would go in there, and and we would oh, see. Oh, by the way, <laughs> wait, wait, stop. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows if this is genetic or not? Yeah, but. If I'm in the middle of some place I've never been, and there's a tomb and stairs going down into the earth, I'm not going. To, I'm I'm a curious guy, yeah. but I gotta draw my line. Okay, <laughs> yeah. that is why every single horror movie never had black people in it because they're not saying, "Oh, look at that spooky house on the hill. Let's go find out." It's like, no, yeah. let's go in the opposite direction. That's a good point. Okay. Yeah, I did. Okay, come so to you, my moved, you went into the spooky tomb. Go. I didn't go very, very far down because my friend, first of all, they're very narrow. It's not, it's very, the people, I guess, were very small back then. So you're hunched over in a very uncomfortable way. Your head's touching what I assumed was moss on the top. My friend goes, wow, look at this stuff on the top, the moss growing on the top. And we noticed it was moving a little. And then we realized it was all bats, which was disgusting. And that, that got us out of there. And the rest of the tomb was filled with water, which is part of it. But we noticed <laughs> yeah. that, and it yeah. was terrifying. And now that you mentioned you had it, it but, coming. Yeah, had I had no sympathy here, okay? Uh, on the side, there's hieroglyphics and pict pictographs and, and the gods and the faces and things like that. And we noticed that uh, the ones towards the top of the stairway were all scratched out, and the ones towards where we were were not. Which that our guide, guide is a loose term, but the boat captain said, "Oh yeah, when people of us, when the is when the I guess the Muslims then came into Egypt, they went and scratched out a lot of the faces. But when they find new tombs, one of the ways they can tell immediately before they look for a robbery or things like that, they can tell immediately if someone's been there and when because the faces are all scratched out or not. Mm -hmm, which mm -hmm, that was interesting. Interesting." Right, right. Um, in the book, you marvel at simple universal truths that are, are beautiful. And it's kind of hard for a layman to wrap their minds around this stuff sometimes, at least for, for me to do it. So here is something that I've always wondered. This is the truth and beauty chapter. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of things in there that sparked 
questions that I think I think are interesting, hopefully interesting. If things in the universe are moving away and moving around and spinning or rotating like the Earth, et cetera, they had to get that energy from somewhere. So does that mean that all the energy for all the objects in the universe, all the things that move and spin and all that, did all that energy come from the Big Bang itself? Yes. Wow. Yes. All of energy, all matter, all even time itself births at the Big Bang. That's correct. That's crazy given how big, I mean, I'm, we're small, but how big the universe is and that you just said it was the size of a marble and it contained all that energy. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's freaky, but what happens is you look at the properties of the universe and you see we're expanding today, that meant we were smaller yesterday, right? And you run the clock back and as you do that, oh, by the way, we're also cooling off the temperature of the universe, which means yesterday the universe was hotter than today. So if you run the clock back, the universe gets hotter, the universe is denser, as you go back in time and you reach a point where, oh my gosh, the laws of physics will manifest differently under these conditions. Well, how big was the universe when that was happening? Well, it was this big, right? The size of a basketball or the size of a, you know, of a, of a blimp or the size. So you can, you can calculate what the temperature and pressure of the universe was and deduce what was going on to the matter subjected to those pressures and temperatures. And how do we know that? Because we do it every day at the particle accelerator in Switzerland. The, the Large Hadron Collider and other particle accelerators simulate the temperatures and pressures you would get at the beginning of the universe. And you see what the matter does. And so we don't just make this up. This is, and, and it, it can be as uncomfortable as it is, but that doesn't mean it's not true just because it doesn't make sense to you. Because the universe has no obligation to make sense to you. Yeah, it's it it it's so, I guess awesome is the real word that I wanna use, but it's an overused word and doesn't really suit the purpose almost anymore. Because you just think about how much energy that is and how small we are. And it's just, it's very humbling, but also it really does give you a little bit of perspective uh, on, how inconsequential certain things should be in our lives, I suppose. And by the way, there is something called negative energy. Okay. Uh, and so uh, there are places where if you add up the negative and positive energy, the total energy budget is just zero. And when you start out with zero energy, you can have negative and positive energy responsible for interestingly different things, yet you began with no energy at all. Okay, so I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, if you have a, a meadow and it's flat and then you sort of dig a hole and put the dirt over to the side, well, you can now climb up the top of that dirt mm -hmm. and you're in a higher place than you were before. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. Where you can go into the hole and you're in a lower place than you were before. But in fact, the total sort of energy change is zero. You just put energy that used to be in one place in another place and at the expense of the energy budget from where you took it. So, in fact, uh, uh, Krauss, a, f a physicist, a friend and colleague, uh, is he wrote a book called The, so the Existence of Nothing? No, uh, Nothing, I, A Universe from Nothing. Uh, okay. a, a Universe from Nothing, where he, he gives a more detailed account of the energy balance and the energy budget uh, for what, for how that works. So if people want to explore that further, I recommend it. How's this one then? If space, and we'll link to that in the show notes, if space is expanding, what is it expanding into? And if the answer is nothing, well, I thought space was nothing. So how can nothing expand into nothingness? That sounds like oh, a space is, yeah, space is anything but nothing. Okay. Uh, I mean, imagine before you knew anything about air molecules, you would say air is nothing. Right. If yeah. there's something there, yeah. I wouldn't be able to see you. So air, it's, it's, so air is not anything. And then you find out, no, air is something. And then, well, how about space? Space is nothing. Then we learn that space is filled with sort of rarefied gas molecules. It's also filled with what we call virtual particles, a prediction of quantum physics. So, and, and the energy level is not zero. So, no, space is not nothing. Well, then what's outside of space? But we want to call it nothing. Well, then what's outside of space? Well, if space is nothing, then where you don't have even nothing, then you might call that nothing, nothing. Okay, it's not even nothing, all right? But you can take this a step further. If in that place, 
there are still laws of physics that apply, can you really say there's nothing there? If you brought something there that obeys the laws of physics, that means the laws of physics permeate that space. So if you wanted a true nothing, you'd have to be in a place where there was not only not matter or energy, virtual or otherwise, you need a place where there was not even the laws of physics. And that's a little freakier. What that what would it mean for you to step into that place? Then all the forces holding the molecules of your body together would dissolve and you'd end up a pile of goo on the ground. <laughs> so or or in space, sure. floating. So uh, so we don't know what's outside of our expansion, um, but we have some hint that the multiverse, which is the, uh, we, are, we are possibly one universe of many being birthed by the multiverse, that outside of our universe is sort of a, a well, there are different versions of it. And uh, let me give the simplest. The simplest is we have one space time one space time and we're a bubble within that space time and other universes are other bubbles so you go outside of our horizon you can go into somebody else's horizon if you could do that and be a part of somebody else's universe that's the mild version of the multiverse there, there are other versions where the laws of physics change as you move from one universe to the other that would be really dangerous if you tried to vacation that way yeah it seems like i mean even a slight change in physics could be a could be a little unhealthy for the delicate Completely human body. Completely catastrophic, yeah. correct, correct. <laughs> All right, I'll bring it back to our galaxy for a minute. Lately, when we hear discussions of space exploration and the immense costs of something like the Webb telescope or, or any space mission, some common complaints that I'll see online especially are, oh, we gotta solve the problems we have here on Earth before we go worrying about space. I assume you disagree but I'd love to hear a well thought out retort to this aside from my own sort of knee jerk reaction. Yeah, so I address that in the exploration and discovery chapter, where uh, what I do is I recreate a conversation that might have taken place in a cave. So go back 30,000 years, we're all cave dwell dwellers. And this is a contrived example, but it, I think it makes makes the point. We're all in there. And there's some young whippersnappers who want to exit the cave because they took a peek through the crack in the door, if caves have doors, <laughs> they took a peek and they see like mountains and valleys and trees with fruit on the, on the vines. And, and they say, wow. And they go to their elders back in the cave and they say, elders, uh, me and my friends, we want to go explore what's outside the cave. And the elders, they caucus and they come back and say, no. We have cave problems here first. Those problems you must solve before we go outside the cave. The sheer absurdity of this requires no, no explanation. So that's what you sound like to me when you say, we have problems here on Earth. We should solve those before we go to the universe. You know how tiny Earth is compared with the universe? Do you know how many resources there are in the universe compared with Earth? And you say, let's solve Earth problems first. And I'm thinking, there can't be anything more boneheaded than that desire, given what we already know about space and given what we know... Uh, <laughs> You know what we know about space and what we know are the challenges that we that still face us and how space could solve them. What are some things that we've done or learned and say or solved in space that's used here on Earth to benefit humankind? Because I, th I think people honestly struggle to think of something that's been solved or, or invented or whatever in space. There's got to be plenty. I just don't know anything off the top of my head. OK. Um, often because it's it's multi layers removed. Sure. So the fact that almost all electronics is currently miniaturized, where it just fits on your hip, that original incentive was NASA, mm -hmm. right? When our grandparents, perhaps your great grandparents, because I'm older than you, talked about listening to the radio, they weren't talking about bopping down the street, holding up a radio to their ear. They're talking about gathering around the piece of furniture called a radio in their living room 
to listen to the radio. At that time, is anyone saying, gee, I want to carry that on my hip? Is that even a thought? You needed to tow it in the car. Mm-hmm. Barely fit in the car. <laughs> Get the trailer. Yeah. You know, portable radio. So, so, well, why does it get miniaturized? Oh, because when NASA has to launch something in a payload section, there's a cer- certain amount of weight that a certain amount of fuel can launch into orbit. And you want to put in as much as you can within the weight limit. And if half your weight is, you know, if your weight can be trimmed in any way possible, do it. Because then you can take up more payload. Sure. Yeah. For the amount of thrust that the rocket is giving you. So, uh, point is, the overall miniaturization of everything electronic has strong drivers from the urge to put things in space. The very James Webb Space Telescope had to be designed so that it furled into a rocket fairing. That telescope is way bigger than any rocket that could possibly launch it. So the engineer says, well, let's fold it furl it so that when we deploy it out in space, it will unfurl and become the great grand uh, telescope that we intended to be. So that's, that's one example. But another one, my physics professor in college, he loved the universe and he did research on detecting gas clouds in the universe and made some important discoveries there. And uh, he also discovered a new phenomenon called magnetic re- nuclear magnetic resonance, where you can put a a radio wave across an an atom and the magnetic field of the atom will interact with the, 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 the radio waves or other waves of light and create a signature on some detector where you know the mass of that atom. Oh, wow. So, so What's valuable here is beyond x-rays where you find the dense bones and materials, this actually can figure out what is the mass of the atom that is responsible for that signal. Okay, a clever medical engineer said, hey, I can build a cavity Mm -hmm. and make a medical device out of this. Thus was born the nuclear magnetic resonance imager. And Mm. Nuclear is one of the two N words you're not supposed to use <laughs> this century. Yes. So they drop the N and it's just MRI. The MRI exists based on a principle of physics discovered by a physicist who had no interest in medicine. How many lies have you seen? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's, yeah, that, that alone not is. Not only that, you're not wearing glasses. Did you have LASIK surgery? I did. Yeah. Thank, thank NASA. Yeah. Did you thank NASA Th- when you came back? I, I, you know, I didn't. I didn't even probably thank the doctor who did it. Now that I think about it. <laughs> okay. I was, thank the doctor first. It was on Valium. Then, but yeah, at the end of it. Then NASA. So what's going on there? Oh, the algorithms used to line up the docking between the, the shuttle and the space station were co opted for aligning the laser cutter to your cornea in LASIK surgery. So what used to happen, as I understood it, they'd line everything up and then your eye would move, okay? Well, that, you know, then the incision goes to the wrong place. This moves the incision with the eye, enabled, empowered by what happened between the space shuttle and the space station. Wow, that's incredible. So so the affordability and reliability are, now, you could still have done that, but separately, but the motivation was clear and present. That is really something. I had no, I had LASIK in the 90s. So when did they? Inv- that was early. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, that was early. Yeah. When did NASA invent this? I must have, I must have been r- rolling right off the back of that. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. Just right. If it's not, wasn't right then, it would have been shortly after that. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. I had no idea it was so early. Mm-hmm. Hey, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There's a lot more just like this. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. A concept I thought was fascinating was the idea that knowledge grows exponentially. And people don't 
understand this. I know that because I didn't. And you explain it well in the book. <laughs> Tell me about this. Again, the exploration and discovery chapter. Yeah. yeah well, tell me about this yeah. and why it matters. I love this concept. I think it brings a lot of hope given the state of ignorance that we find a lot of the world in these days. And it's, you just think, oh my gosh, it took us, we're still here and this is all we have. But this is sort of a ray of light. Yeah. So, so it's tempting to think to yourself, we live in special times. Look at the JWST. Look at the sharp images from the surfaces of comets and asteroids and other planets. Well, oh, and, and look how amazing these images are. All that's true. Yeah. But you would have said the same thing about the Hubble telescope. And I said the same thing about the 200-inch the Palomar telescope in, in California. These are telescopes that in their day were pioneering. And so, of course, you're going to celebrate it because they, what they provided was without precedent. So, of course, uh, that would be the case. So, so... I'm just trying to impress upon you the the just just the what's the point I was making? I was making three points and then it collapsed to two and then it's a black, the last point I made black hole of points. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. So the, the last point I made was what exponential thinking. We we're talking about exponential thinking. Yes. And okay, so what happens is um, each one, no matter where you rejoin civilization. If they're on an exponential curve, it'll look like you're in a special time and feel that way as well. So here we are reveling at this, at these photos, but wait, 1958, Boeing introduced the first passenger jetliner, the Boeing 707. Do you know that the distance flown by the Wright brothers in 1903 was less than the wingspan <laughs> of that 707 airplane. I did not know that. I figured they at least flew down a hill or something. No. <laughs> Maybe not. So all of this is on an exponential growth curve. Yes. And what, what that means is you, you can't predict the future. Mm -hmm. This stuff is going to come in from left field, from center field, from places where you don't see it coming. And then bada bing, there it is. Bada bing, laser on your eyes because the space station needed to dock with the yeah crack. correct yeah and there's no way you know the people who wrote that those algorithms liked space stations and like space shuttles and like space and probably wore right? glasses and still didn't think about this right <laughs> so <laughs> uh so um yeah just just keep that in mind when, when the times come in the book there's a little anecdote about a guy who predicted that nothing could ever beat the railroad and the steamship oh. because this is oh. the pinnacle oh. of technological progress. Of transportation yeah. of transportation 19 year 1900 correct yeah the year 1900 the head of the new york central railroad reflecting on life in the year 2000 says uh we can scarcely imagine that transportation will be advanced in the 21st century as they were in the 19 in the 20th century no, no, no. Uh, in the 20th century because he's talking about entering the 1900s the 20th century versus exiting the 1800s which of course is the 19th century so he's saying I, we can scarcely imagine that transportation in the 20th century will be as rapid and advanced as they were in the 19th i mean he's right if he's talking about amtrak but with the, he got the ship part completely wrong <laughs> <laughs> correct Correct. The book contains a lot of scientific developments and inventions that have changed the world, and you list them by by decade, kind of. And, and the message is that life in each era of 30 years would be unrecognizable to the one previous. In other words, the life we're living in the 2020s would be alien and unrecognizable to somebody living in 1990. And this stuff is really amazing when you think about it, because it's not really that long of a time to have these it's massive not. changes. And improvements. It's not. And, and I found the 30 year increment for civilization mm -hmm. just to have it, um, just to have, you know, for the sake of definiteness, I said, what is the, what might be the doubling time of civilization? And I just hypothesized 30 years just to be long enough so that, you know, you have kids if you're going to have kids or not, but that the, uh, we'd be able to highlight um, things that would be undreamt of at the beginning of the 30 year period and then are taken for granted at the end. You, you, uh, you, 
You were a Star Trek fan. You talk about that in a lot of your books. And I love how you admit nobody can predict the future, including futurists. This Star Trek anecdote is is really funny. You said, yes, we're going to have interdimensional transport, photon torpedoes, but there is no way a door will open for you automatically when you walk near it. That I had exactly those thoughts. I, I was like, yeah, pho- I'm with it. Photon torpedoes, check. Mm-hmm. Uh, replicator, check. They had an early version of a microwave oven where the food heated it immediately. Wow. Check. All of that. All of that. And I... Uh, yeah. Now, and then grocery I, stores got I, no, the no, door no, like no, 10 no, years right, later. Then I walk up, to, walk up to a door. They walk up to a door and the door just opens all by itself. I said, no, that'll never happen. How does it know that the door should open? And a little later, there were these door pads you'd step on outside of grocery stores that connected a circuit. I remember thinking about that. And and now, of course, it uses uh, infrared. Yeah, that, or, or, I had endless fun with those frequency. as a kid. And then when the pad went away, I remember standing there thinking, how does this one work? I'm standing on the concrete right now. This right, is really... Right. And my mom's like, come on in. I'm like, no, 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 I got to figure this out. I got to figure, figure it out. I got to figure this out. Curious guy. He's going to have a podcast one day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like my, my mom would have told you, I, I hope he doesn't, I, I have higher hopes for my son than a, being a mere podcaster or broadcaster. <laughs> uh, now, of course, different story. Uh, another space, <laughs> another, she's given up. <laughs> she's given up on me. Uh, another space question or two, because I can't resist. At some point, the sun will go red giant and expand to, I think, 10 million times the size it is now, give or take engulfing Earth's orbit, or at least part of it, right? Am I right on this part so 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 far? Uh, I've forgotten the exact, no, but the the fact that it will grow large enough to engulf Mercury, engulf Venus, and come most of the way towards Earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's 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 the death of the sun. Fortunately, that's long into the future. Fortunately. So this will melt the rock and everything else on Earth when that happens. I assume, right? <laughs> Or is there? Yes. Yes, to say the least. So what happens to the water? It won't leave the planet, but it will be boiled into what? Super hot steam? Yeah, so the water boils into the atmosphere, evaporates into the atmosphere, Mm -hmm. and the atmosphere evaporates into space. Ah, okay. So, yeah. So you lose all the water. So, so because I just thought maybe it all is one sort of blob, or there's some nuclear reaction that happens that will change the elements of the materials on Earth. But it sounds like there's just no more Earth at all at that point. Uh, at that point, no, that's correct. Uh, we'd just be this charred ember orbiting deep within the surface of the red giant star, never to see the light of day again. So everything but the heaviest. Only, only to see the dark, the darkness of night. Yeah. That, that, oh, so only the heaviest elements kind of remain as a chunk and everything else is just gone into the solar system somewhere. Uh, yeah, the heavier ones will sink to the bottom and they you get to those last, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned, and I won't be here for that, so I, that's the end of me thinking yeah. about it. <laughs> I got it on my calendar. I got <laughs> <Yeah. it. laughs> you mentioned that, that wouldn't surprise me if you actually did. You mentioned there are freshwater comets and minerals and on asteroids and other celestial bodies that are greater than the amount of these minerals ever mined in the history of our planet, in the, of the world. So since we just discovered that nobody, or since we just discussed that nobody can predict the future, you realize now I'm going to have to ask you to predict the future. How far away are we? from being able to access those resources? Is it decades or is it centuries? Which, wait, which resources? The, the, the minerals on asteroids and freshwater comets and things okay. like that. Okay, got, got it. You're talking about um, asteroid miners. Yeah. So uh, I would say 15 years. Really? Well, we already have missions that have been to them. Now we want to characterize the surface and understand where it's most friendly or where it's least friendly, and then check with the loved ones and then go. Wow. And may, what, what, how would we get it back? Just blast it into the Earth's orbit so it lands in the ocean and it's just a solid thing of gold or what? I mean, how do we plan to well, do that? Yeah. Uh, most of how you would use it is uh, if it's water, you would melt it and then distribute it to other space operations. I see. So right now, right now, it costs NASA about $10,000 a pound to launch anything into orbit. So if you can drop that price, that's good. Elon Musk is attempting to drop the launch costs of vessels, but um, if you um, so, so if you do that, then you go to these asteroids and 
you have the minerals, you have the water, and you sell it to NASA, who is on orbit. So if, if, if it costs $10,000 for NASA to launch one pound of payload, let's say one pound of water, that's 16 ounces, and you just melted 16 ounces of water off of a comet and you can hand it to the astronauts, that's one pound NASA didn't have to launch. They can make their spacecraft smaller mm -hmm. with a more efficient design. And so uh, that's... That, that's how that would, would okay. unfold. Oh, by the, what would you sell it for? Yeah. You sell it for $9,000. Sure, $9, I just meant, <laughs> I, so we're not talking about bringing gold or some sort of rare earth mineral from an asteroid back to Earth for manufacturing. You're talking about leaving in, in it in space. In principle, you could, but the first law of economics, or is it the second, you bring all that gold back, then gold becomes worthless. Right, yeah. So you could do it a few times, and then that's it. Or you get one comet, and you just break off little chunks Provided you don't destroy the Earth, bringing it back to the surface, which sounds more likely to happen. Like, what caused this tsunami? Definitely wasn't me bringing this giant gold comet back into the atmosphere. Don't look at me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. <laughs> I know space exploration, obviously, near and dear to your heart as it is for a lot of people. What was your reaction when, was it the Russian foreign minister or whoever it was, was saying things like, oh, we're going to leave Americans in the ISS, in the International Space Station. We're not going to let American astronauts on a Russian rocket to come back home. We're just going to leave them up there. For me, that was profoundly disappointing because it was like this line had been crossed that didn't need to be crossed at all. It's just politicians being babies again. I mean, it's, think about it. When you go to school, in elementary school, there's a globe on the, on the back shelf and it's a globe of the Earth. And there might be more than one globe, but if there's only one globe, it's going to be the globe that has color-coded countries. Why are we doing that? It's just a landmass. Oh, they're telling you implicitly who your friends are and who your enemies are mm -hmm. geopolitically. Look over there, cross that border, they're enemies and they're fighting and there's a war over here and it's always across some boundary, some border. So that we're learning from scratch that we have enemies and we have friends. And I grew up in the Cold War, Russians are the enemies, okay? Yeah. Cold War ends, then now there are friends. Hey, let's do science together, okay? So now uh, Putin behaves badly, we react, worse than badly, we react, it's a geopolitical incident, and we have Russians and Americans in space, looking down on an earth where they do not see color-coded countries. What do you do, okay? So if I'm there and there's a Russian there, do we get into a fist fight because our leaders are getting into fist fights? Really? <laughs> We're scientists, engineers. We're spacefarers. So, okay, I don't know what I would, I think I know what I would have done, but I don't know how to do this experiment. I would have said to my fellow spacefarer from another country, um, we're in space and we're above it all. Let's continue our experiments and be an example to people on earth for how they should behave. That's maybe that's a little too wishful thinking for me. I don't know. My, my two, my two kumbaya. No, I don't think so. Hands. I don't think so because if anything you know, goes wrong up there, he's going to be like, yeah, forget all that stuff. The foreign minister said, I really need you to pull me out of this life in exactly, that situation right now. Yeah. Exactly. The foreign minister, the ambassador, what, whoever and whatever it is. So, so for me, the first bus into orbit would get the heads of state of all warring nations, especially those that are warring across a border. So um, you wouldn't need Canada and the United States because that's, that's a peaceful border, but there are plenty of contested borders around North and South Korea, right, for example. Um, I was going to say Kim Jong Un, the, but man, that's a lot of, yeah. that's $10,000 no, times a lot. And <laughs> it's not just him. Yeah. You want to send others too, so that they can have this experience together. The astronauts have called this an overview effect. For me, the overview effect is like in low earth orbit, but as an astrophysicist, you get another notch higher and view earth from the moon. And then you see all of earth in one, in one frame as this isolated orb alone in the dark vastness of space with no hint that help is going to come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves 
When you see Earth that way, that's a cosmic perspective. And there's not enough of that in the world today. And one of the chapters called Earth and Moon, the subtitle is, is A Cosmic Perspective. So take all the heads of states, the ambassadors, and all the people who are sure they have the one true way to make love to other people, to the one true way to, to worship a God, the one true way to run a country, get all the people who are certain they have the one true way and everybody else is wrong, put them all up in space, leave them there for a month and then bring them down. That could be transformative. It could be the greatest peace act ever performed. NASA would get the Nobel Peace Prize for sending them up. I'm wondering how long it is till you get your field trip to space in high school, just to give you that same perspective. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Oh, by the way, let me just set the record straight. Mm -hmm. I'm an astrophysicist. So to me, space is moon, Mars, beyond okay. a destination. Sure. What they would, what the billionaire boys club was doing, you know, uh, Bezos and Branson and, and Elon Musk, Elon Musk went a little higher, but Bezos and Branson went the thickness of two dimes. <laughs> above a schoolroom globe. Yeah. All right. It's shrink earth or school uh, two dimes. And so, no, you can't just take a picture of all of Earth in your field of view. You're not far enough away for that to happen. Okay. And they're up to saying, oh, the country borders disappear. That happens in, on, a, on a transcontinental airplane. Okay. You don't see national borders from an airplane. So, I, if you're going to put me in space, I don't want to boldly go where hundreds have gone before. All right? Put me, you know, send me to a destination and I'll sign up. All right. I'm not sure. Bring the family. Yeah, bring the family. Give me a good or, streaming or account. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure Netflix mm -hmm. has got some downloaded stuff in case of turbulence. Exactly. In case the connection breaks. <laughs> right. <laughs> Save your Spotify playlists. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm not sure why this one resonated so well with me, but you talk about, I think it's called LD50 and the amounts of substances that it takes to kill people. And I'd love to dive into some of this because the example you give, one of the examples is Ben and Jerry's banning GMO corn syrup because of, is it glyphosate or something like that? Uh, gl glyphosate. 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 Okay. I knew mean, something like that. Yeah. I just think it's funny somehow that there's an amount of, there's an amount of just about everything that if you eat it, it will kill you, including foods right. we love, or maybe even especially foods we love. And you know, it's no surprise, okay, nicotine, caffeine, salt, fine, that seems obvious that there's an amount of those that would kill you, but it's funny that things we often think of as normal food can actually be totally lethal if ingested all at the same time. So naturally, the question arises, how many pints of Ben & Jerry's do you need to eat before you die on the spot oh, from doing so? Okay, so what started all this was when, you know, before monkeypox and before COVID, uh, every, there's always something everybody's worrying about. And so there was a quite, there was a spell there a few years where GMO foods were in headlines, uh, genetically modified organisms. And there's a general hate movement against GMO foods, mostly led by people who, who want to sell you organic foods. So in Whole Foods, where organic foods is a very big part of their sort of their their food education that they're giving you, um, there's all these foods that say no GMOs on it, mm -hmm. so that you you juxtapose no GMOs with 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 organic, and you're saying, oh, I'm buying organic or I'm buying no GMOs. That way, I'm healthier. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, we, this show is not long enough to go into the fascinating history of genetically modified organisms. By the way, dogs were the first GMOs. We invented dogs. We were not we were unhappy with the genome of the wolf and we said, "We want you to lick our face instead of rip our neck out. Let's change the genes." And we did it by selective breeding, but then we get better at it, you do it in a laboratory, all right? For me there's no difference. You can say there's a difference, but I'll tell you this, I want heirloom tomatoes by the way, there, if you go back in time <laughs> before we created the genetic line that gives us modern tomatoes, there's no big juicy tomatoes. There, we invented cows for goodness sake. There are no herds of milk cows wandering <laughs> the countryside. 
or 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 other herds of wagyu be- steer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right? We invented cows to turn grass into milk and grass into steak. Cows are genetically modified organisms. Period. Okay. Now, if you want to say, well, I don't want it to happen in a lab. It's okay if the farmer does it, but not in the lab. Well, the, the result is the same in the sense that you're creating something that, that does not exist in nature. And yeah, you want to test it because like, might it harm you? Plenty of stuff in nature will harm you. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Stuff we create, you want to test that too. So of course they test it. Of course. Here's the point. Okay. Um, there, uh, Monsanto back when they were an independent company, they're now owned by Bayer, I think. Monsanto did something diabolically brilliant, okay? The farmer's trying to get rid of weed, get rid of weeds in, in their corn crops. Weeds are devastating to, to, to crops because they're taking all the nutrients, all the water, all the sunlight, and all right. So what did they used to do? Everybody used to do, they'd get this herbicide and they'd sort of spray it where the weeds were, very labor intensive because otherwise it's going to kill the kill your corn or, okay an herbicide kills plants right so they aim for the dirt and and this is nasty stuff they were using okay fine monsanto says we have an idea we just created an herbicide that will only kill the 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 um weeds and not kill the corn oh wait 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 it can't just be any corn, it's corn that they developed, right. okay? So they found the place on the DNA of the weed, targeted that, and that place on the DNA of the corn, because they're both photosynthesizing plants, they remove that from the corn plant. So now, okay, you can spray it over the entire crop and it'll only kill the weeds. Okay, and the lethality of the glyphosate is way less than the lethality of anything they were using before. And it's water soluble, okay? So farmers loved it, okay, loved it. But there'd be traces of glyphosate in the food that you grew or in the soil from which you'd grow the next plant. And corn, you used to make corn syrup a sweetener for so many foods. Ben and Jerry's for some of their ice creams used corn syrup. By the way, I was surprised by that too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Ben and Jerry's at first, they used corn syrup. What? Really? Surprise. It's Ben and Jerry's Vermont. Really? Okay. So I had to get past that first. Then the corn syrup they used was corn from corn that had been um, grown with uh, glyphosate as the herbicide, okay? Oh, by the way, so the point, what made it diabolically brilliant is if you wanna use their herbicide, you have to buy their corn, right? So this is, they got you both ways. It was a, all right, so anyhow. And again, a whole GMO show is a different conversation. Sure, yeah. But point is glyphosate has what's called an LD50 like does, as does anything else. LD50 is called lethal dose 50 where if you ingest this amount and this lethal dose is typically established in tests on laboratory mice which are highly genetically similar to humans if you it's if you consume this much of that substance per kilogram of body weight 50 percent of you will die of the people who do this so it's called ld50 it's a fascinating and and everything has an ld50 everything Everything. the the smaller the ld50 the more lethal it is, because it means you take less of it to kill you. So got it? Okay, so I do get it. Wait, wait, wait. So, so poisons have LD fifties that are really tiny, but other things that are more normal also have LD fifties. Nicotine is one of the most deadly substances out there. It is a very low LD fifty. Caffeine has an LD fifty. So here it is. Uh, and so the number for demi test cups of espresso, you'd have to eat 100, drink 150 demi test cups of espresso. That's the correct number. Okay. For half the people who do that to die from it. Okay. All right. So what else? Oh, the least deadly thing on the list is sugar, as you might expect with people eating sugar all the time. All right. 
So the sugar itself is not killing you, even if it has complications that do. But the point is the glyphosate. So you need to consume 400 million pints of Ben and Jerry's ice cream for its trace amounts of glyphosate to kill you. But 20 pints, eat 20 pints, the sucrose will kill you first. So <laughs> the sugar content is lethal at a dose far lower of, of pints of ice cream than the glyphosate given its, uh, the micro doses found in it. And so, but people aren't thinking about it that way. They've created an enemy. The GMO is like the enemy without really thinking through the relative risks. And so this book is an attempt to, to rebalance how people think about their lives, what they think is true, what isn't, but especially one truth relative to another truth and what emerges from an analysis, a dispassion analysis of both. Neil, if you, it's, it's misplaced priorities in society. I, I, look, I, I agree. I, I too would like to die by Ben and Jerry's. If you have to, ah, if you have to die ben by Ben and Jerry's, what flavor do you choose? For yourself, mm -hmm. you're gonna. This is your the last thing you'll ever there eat, and you have to eat apparently five gallons of it at once. <laughs> what flavor is it going to be? And you'll die from it. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. You got a favorite Ben and Jerry's? One that you'd? Oh, you're asking? Oh, oh yeah. Directly what, at yeah. What flavor are you picking? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, pro probably. Hmm. Hmm. I'd have to think because I lean Hagen dazs You lean Hagen dazs my... Well, yeah. There, there goes the fruit. Well, that, that sugar will kill you too. But they're not. They're not claiming. You know, they're, they're right. selling you something healthy, right? I mean, I can think of one. My favorite flavor is, is strawberry. Okay, fair, yeah. fair. A little basic, but fair. I think this. This fruitless effort to get Ben and Jerry's to sponsor this podcast is just never going to happen at this point. Oh. <laughs> One, it'll kill you, and two, I prefer Hagen dazs um, <laughs> 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 All right. Yeah, if I'm spending five dollars on a pint of ice cream, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be picking. Get what about you it. like, man. Get that strawberry. All right. So I, yeah. I know I got to let you go, but I'm gonna leave you with one final question here. If if cows are GMOs because of selective breeding over time. My grandparents and great grandparents and parents all selected each other in theory because of certain traits. Does that mean that I am also a GMO? Yeah. So you're only a GMO really if you can create like a whole sort of subspecies of it, right? So and and the and the the so in a way, nature is making GMOs all the time. All right, nature's genetically modifying organisms, those that could survive some assault on their environment relative to all the others who die. A, a little known sort of correction I want to put out there, in evolution, nothing adapts. The organisms do not adapt to the change of an environment. Mm. They either survive it or it kills them. And if they survive it, it's because they had some unplanned variation in them that enables them to move through that, that, that portal, that environmental assault portal, to then have offspring that have some of their own properties, mm -hmm. okay? And that's how nature moves through. By the way, mother nature, caring mother nature, is responsible for the extinction of 99% of all species there ever was. So you're being very selective when you say, oh, nature cares about life. No, she doesn't. No, she doesn't. She's about life in general, but a species doesn't give a rat's ass. Compete with the other species, and if you die, I don't care. And if most of you die and only one of you gets through, I, I designed it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so nature is, is one of the most lethal things operating on Earth. This is another one of these just things you should know if you're otherwise running around making claims that actual data and perspective does not do not support. Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you so much. It's always fun having you on. I always learn a ton and I look forward to the next one. Excellent. Thank, thanks for having me. Thanks for checking out this entire episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're interested in exploring this topic further, check out The Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There, we dive even deeper on this and many other topics. 
In the audio podcast, I also close open loops, cover things discussed off camera, off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, and subscribe.